it's good to see so many people that I recognize and also so many people that I don't recognize as well, which is which is really good. Uh, so this, this event was set up in relatively short notice. Um, it was only over the weekend that you know we decided to do it and and the demand has been really good and I think that's just a reflection of you know where we are at the moment in the world and so today I think you know we want to have a really open conversation uh, an honest conversation and a thoughtful one as well um, so some of you might not know me uh, my name is Elliot Ray I'm the founder of a platform called Music Football Fatherhood and it's a parenting and lifestyle platform for men we're all about open conversations around fatherhood. We create content around education and bullying, relationships, single parenting, expecting dads, new dads, work-life balance, and of course, race. We have a blog, musicfootballfatherhood.com, which is you know, one of the most recognized in the UK for, for fathers and parenting. And we have a podcast called Daddy Debates as well. And we have a team of 20, a lot of, of whom are on the call right now. So shout out to you if you're on the call. Um, editors, writers, social media managers as well. So, so yeah, reach out to us anytime on the socials at MFF online underscore. And I want to say a big congratulations for any parents who have managed to get their child in bed at 8.30. That's impressive. Kirsty, I can see you. <laughs> that, is, that is an achievement. Luckily, it was not my night to put my daughter to bed. It was my wife's night. And I think she's just achieved it as well. She's going to log on in a minute. Um, but as I said, you know, we, we want to kind of get to know each other a little bit as well. There's a lot of people that we won't know, we've never seen before. Um, so what we're going to do, first and foremost, we're going to use the, the chat function. And what we need to do in the chat, fun chat function is just say, you know, where in the world you are. We don't need your street name and your street address. Just the, the town is enough, uh, whether that's New York, whether you're in Gloucestershire, Leicester, London, Georgia. Um, put that in the chat and also next to that, just write down how you're feeling as well. How are you feeling today? Um, how have you felt this week? But really, how are you feeling in this moment? Let us know how you're feeling in this moment because what we're going to do is when we finish this session, we're going to do that again. And uh, hopefully, there'll be some difference if we've had a good session. So put that in there over the next couple of minutes. I think it's important to say, you know, I, I know that people, myself, you know, a lot of us on this call um, have been hurting this week. There's been a, a major event around the world. The world has changed, I think, after these events. And this particular incident has got people feeling angry um, and sad and frustrated and tired, all those feelings. And it's because it feels like in some aspects we haven't moved forward, it feels like we've moved back. You know, a lot, of the, a lot of the images that we're seeing now are things that we used to see in black and white when there wasn't camera phones around. There wasn't um, ca colour camera phones around. It was from the 40s and the 30s and the 50s. Um, whereas now we're seeing them live on social media and we're getting sent them on WhatsApp and Twitter. And it's traumatic. You know, what happened was a, was a modern day lynching. And anyone that's seen that video knows just how bad it was. But it's important to have these conversations right now. And I think, you know, for us to try and move forward and make sure that, you know, George Floyd didn't die in vain. And at this moment, that seems to have captured the world. You know, us as individuals, we can do what we can to try and take some positive out of that and, and try and improve things in the world. So I hope you're using that chat function and and telling us where you are in the world, how you're feeling. And I know many of you have listened just to, to, to listen, join just to listen, that's fine. Um, and I know some have also joined to input. And I think that's both great. You know, you're all welcome. The session's being recorded, so we'll be able to listen to it afterwards as well. And I wanna give a special big shout out to the people who are joining us from the US. Um, I can see Devin on my screen. I hope Danny is there, I hope Jesse is there. And I hope TB Honest is there as well. There's so many people I can't see on my screen, but a massive shout out to you. Uh, we are in solidarity with you. I know that we don't experience what you're experiencing right now, but we feel you and we're so happy that you're here and we want to hear from you. We want to hear what you've got to say. So yeah, massive shout out and thanks so much for joining. So in terms of this call 
and you know how do you want to be how do you want to behave as i said this this went out on social media so it is really an open forum there's plenty of us on here that won't know each other um, we don't know each other's backgrounds we don't know where we're from and i think you know for us to do this we really 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 need to make sure that at the forefront we are respectful of each other um, we are inclusive we're kind to each other you know we're all learning at the moment we're all feeling a lot of things and the most the best we can do is just to listen and try and understand so we're open for questions and you know we've got some great speakers feel free to ask some questions but please do be kind and make sure that you're keeping that in your mind that everyone is learning um, and everyone's trying to do the best they can okay um, that being said if there is any rude behavior any offensive behavior I have no um, qualms in kicking people out. You will get dashed out. <laughs> so I've heard a few, uh, Michelle, shout out Michelle, he did mention that a couple of other these calls, there's been people joining and, you know, basically racist undercover that have been, uh, you know, disruptive and saying things. But if that does happen, don't worry, we'll just remove the person and we'll keep going, okay? So the overall message is be kind. We wanna have a good conversation. Let, let's listen to each other. In terms of the format, so I'll set the context. I'm going to speak for a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about you know what has happened, and ultimately I think what what's brought us here. And then we're going to go into some of our speakers. We've got six, we've got twelve speakers. Um, they don't know when they're going to get called up, so I'm keeping them on their toes. So I'm going to call the first set of speakers one by one. They're going to talk, and after that we'll have a, you know an opportunity for some Q&A and some questions and some sharing. And then we'll go back in with the second set of speakers and then we'll close after that. Um, so if you are speaking, please do keep it to three or four minutes. I know we are humans and we like to talk when we've got the floor, um, but we wanna hear from everyone. I do have a loud, a loud horn, which is one of my daughter's toys. Um, and I will sound that horn if it gets to over five minutes, okay? So a gentle reminder um, to, to please do that. Okay, so that's it for, for introductions. And, you know, why, why are we here? So we know that George Floyd was murdered on the 25th of May in Minneapolis. I'm sure you've all seen the video. And he was killed for suspicion of using a $20 counterfeit note. And I saw a tweet yesterday, which really brought home the situation. So at M underscore D underscore McCoy tweeted, George Floyd and I were both arrested for allegedly spending a $20 counterfeit bill. For George Floyd, a man my age with two kids, it was a death sentence. For me, it is a story I sometimes tell at dinner parties. That, my friends, is white privilege. And that's been shared 1.6 million times since Monday. And since the murder, people have been protesting, not just in reaction to this murder, but to many others. You may recognize the names of Sandra Bland, Orlando Castle, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown. You've probably heard of Eric Gardner, who was also choked to death in 2014 on the street by police. He, like George, also said, I can't breathe. That phrase is, is not new, we've heard it before. And just a few weeks ago, Ahmed Aubrey was killed while he was on a jog by two racists in Georgia. Riona Taylor was killed by police while she was sleeping in her own flat. And Amy Cooper was caught on film weaponizing her whiteness by calling police and claiming to be harassed by Christian Cooper, a black man who was just asking her to put her dog on a leash. So the protest and the feeling at the moment, you know, I think is in response to all of that. Uh, this is the biggest civil, civil rights movement since 1992 in, in response to Rodney King. And there have been protests all around the world, including New Zealand, in Amsterdam, um, and of course here in where I am in London. And of course, in England, we are not innocent to, to police killings or to racist murders. You may recognize the names Stephen Lawrence, Mark Duggan, Cherry Gross, Dalian Atkinson, Smiley Culture, just to name a few. In fact, according to figures from Inquest, which is a charity that focuses on state related deaths, a disproportionate number of people from BAME communities die in police custody. Since 1990, they number 151. And its statistics covering the period 2012 to 20. 2002 to 2012 are even more striking. Of over of 380 deaths in police custody in England and Wales, or as a direct result in contact with the police, 69 were for BAME communities, 
and that is 18%. So the George Floyd model has brought all these feelings to the forefront, but it's in the context of you know, the wider issues. And I think all these things are bringing us here today and what makes it important for us to talk about race and talk about how we are having those conversations with our children and our young people. Around George Floyd's murder, we've seen Donald Trump um, be completely unhelpful to, to say the least. You know, on Twitter, to, in response to white people protesting against coronavirus with guns on the 1st of May, Donald Trump tweeted, the governor of Michigan should give a little and put out the fire. These are very good people, but they are angry. They want their lives back again, safely. See them, talk to them, make a deal. And on the 29th of May, the same month, he tweeted in response to the murder of a black man, just spoke to Governor Tim Waltz and I told him the military is with him all the way. Any difficulty and we assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And I can guarantee you if black people were protesting with guns, they would all be dead. And this is all happening in the midst of a global pandemic. We're in the middle of COVID-19. And we know that from the Public Health England report that was published a couple of days ago, um, COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting vain people. I read from the report, the highest age standardized diagnosis rates of COVID-19 per 100,000 population were in the people of black ethnic groups and the lowest were in the people of white ethnic groups. Analysis of survival among confirmed COVID-19 cases shows that after accounting for the effects of sex, age, deprivation and, re and region, people of Bangladeshi ethnicity had twice the risk of death when compared to people of white British ethnicity. People of Chinese, Indian, Pakistani, other Asian, Caribbean and other black ethnicity had between 10 and 50% higher risk of death when compared to white British. And we add all that in the context of Windrush, of Grenfell and some of the racist rhetoric um, around Brexit. And this all means that people are feeling it at the moment, sad, frustrated, distracted, um, but we as parents and guardians and humans, we have a responsibility to talk to our children, um, to support our young people. They will be seeing the news just like we will be. They will be seeing social media just like we will be. And they will be affected by this all. So how can we talk to our children and young people um, and have the impact on their lives? And how, how do we impact how they're going to view the world when they grow up? How do we impact their perspective? Our children, we don't know each other, but they may grow up and interact with each other later on in the world in, in time. Um, how do we want them to talk to each other? How do we want them to see each other? What kind of views do we want them to have? And I think it's got conversation we, we need to have, and I assume you, you agree with me too, it's why you're here. Um, but it can be quite difficult, it's really hard. I've got a four-year-old, um, and you know, from about a year and a half ago, we had to have conversations about her hair and things that I thought would never start as early as they did. And I know that plenty of you have got other stories of more children and older children and, um, and much, much more kind of in-depth in stories to go into. So I've said all that and it is, I've said that because I think it's important to set the context of why we're here. It's the reality. Um, but at the same time, I am optimistic. I think that we can, we can, change. I don't think racism is going to get fixed overnight, but I feel like we do have an opportunity to at least improve. And I think we all have a responsibility to try and do the best we can in that. And so I'm really happy that we have, you know, some great speakers who are going to share um, some of their thoughts and feelings around how they talk to, to their children and their young people. They're not all parents. But how they talk to their children or their young people about race and about racism. We have black people, Asian people, white people contributing as well. And before we get into that, I just want to reiterate that this is a safe space. Um, we want to hear people. We want people to feel open and be able to express themselves. Okay, so let's kick off with our first speaker, who is Kirsty Jones. And Kirsty is from East London. Um, she's the mum of two beautiful boys, aged three and seven. That's from my bio. I haven't seen them, but I assume they are. Um, she currently works in Waltham Forest Council. Um, she's a founder of a community group called The Manden and also a director of a charity called Westside Young Leaders Academy, which is a supplementary school for children aged 8 to 16 of African Caribbean descent. 
She's also a parent governor of a primary school and an Ask Me ambassador, which is an organization that supports young people and their families who have been affected by youth violence or crime. So Kirsty, before you go into it, just a reminder, drop comments in, in, in the comment section and we're gonna have a Q&A after the first section of speakers. So at that point, feel free to use the hands up um, function to come in. But Kirsty, over to you. Thank you very much, Elliot. Um, so if with regards to the question, how do I speak to um, my children about race and racism? Well, I'm gonna explain to my children and also how we speak to our young people in the organizations that are working about race and racism because it's quite different so with my own children that conversation started from the get-go from the minute they were born and it wasn't you know, let's talk about race and racism it's let me make sure the foundation is laid before i even begin to broach the subject so I'm half and half and half is from Ghana. So my children have um, African, Caribbean and white uh, mix. So um, for me, it was really important to ensure that they knew their background, that they loved their skin, that they loved their hair. So the learning started very, very young. It's every day telling them, you've got beautiful brown skin, you've got beautiful curly hair and just laying that foundation for them so that when they get older, they already really teach a young sorry, Chris, you're, cu you're cutting out a little bit. Oh, Maybe sorry. try taking your headphones off. Can you hear me better? That's better. Yeah, okay, great, sorry. Um, yeah, so for me, it's really about laying the foundation for your children and making sure before that you talk about how you love your culture, how you love how beautiful their skin is, just filling them with all that self esteem before we even broach self esteem. Um, so I do make sure that you know, books are very varied. We have um, books that have children in it that look like them uh, that are from africa from the caribbean that are from other parts of the world that they're watching programs that are diverse as well and it's not all one you know one culture one race um that we're really just filling them up with as much cultural confidence as possible so that when they get older and the questions start coming up about race and racism they're, they're, they've already got that foundation within. I think that's really important because you can't start the conversation that people don't like you because of the colour of your skin. We can't start the conversation there. It has to be first your skin, your hair, everything about you is beautiful. So that when you start talking about this, there's some, you can start saying, you know, there's some people out there that don't like that. But do you know what? You already know that you're beautiful. So it doesn't matter. So that's why I approach it with my children. And with you, I've been back with you at 16. Because they're a little bit older, and um, because it will be, you know, we can talk about the hair subjects and races. Okay, so it's hanging out a little bit. I'm not quite sure if it's. What is it? Sorry. I'm going to laptop or. Um, yeah, so with our older children, um, we can then have those conversations. But even at, in our organisations, the first thing we do is to keep it off. So you can, as a parent, I would talk about my own history. Um, we get our young leaders to look at their lineage and where they have to come from. And um, then we make sure they are there. So we can look at the whole history. We keep the history. Okay, Kirsty, I can't hear you. It's, it's, it sounds like you're in a, a Robocop or something. Oh, <laughs> I'm Sorry, a lot of I metal. don't know what's going on. Let me see if I can <laughs> turn the sound up on my laptop. Okay, let's give it another go. Okay. Can you hear me better? Yeah, we'll give it another go. Let's just try. Okay. So, yeah, um, at Westside, we make sure that we have like a culturally, cultural, culturally competent curriculum so everything that's in our 
um, curriculum is uh, African centered. And everything we teach, we have an African centered focus. And then we will have discussions with our young people about how these, these incidents make them feel. If they have a passion for seeing then we will mix that. I think it's good to sit down with you when you pull out the reality, especially oh, if they're a bit older. Kirsty, okay, so it's coming in now, it's what we'll do. Okay, no worries. There's a few suggestions in the chat. Um, could be the microphone, volume, bandwidth, we don't know, but I think we got the gist. Okay. And what we'll do, we'll try and come back to you a bit later, but thanks so much. We got, we got the gist of what, of what you were saying. Thank, thanks for that. Um, okay, let's go over to, to, let's go to the US now. This is a UK US call and we have TB Honest. I've seen TB Honest on the call. He's a hip hop artist and father based out of El Paso, Texas. I've got seven kids. I don't know how you're coping. I've got one and I'm knackered. So big up to you, seven children, three boys, four girls. And um, when he's not releasing music as a rapper, he works as an X-ray, CT tech, as a few hospitals. Um, it's all about giving back and instilling my children with, children with the tools to succeed in the world. Um, so, to be honest, let's go to you. Uh, we can't hear you. Are you on? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, that's better. All right. I was hoping that the earphones work, but I guess not. Uh, well, greetings here from El Paso, Texas, over here in America. Uh, I appreciate all y'all concern and, and, and even thinking about us in this this very extreme time. You know, it's it's a very touching, and I'm glad that we could get to talk about this on a, such a broad uh, platform. But uh, one of the first things I want to talk about is, as far as me having seven kids, it's really important that, and I like that that uh, cultural confidence that Kirsty said. Uh, that was really touching. I'm gonna remember that for a long time. And uh, I have a couple of my kids sleep in the back right now. And, and that might even be the, one of the first conversations we have when they wake up. But when it comes to history in America, a lot of things people don't realize is that in school, they don't teach them everything. They kind of omit a lot of the cultural disenfranchisement that we get here. And it's our jobs as parents to make sure that they know from our perspective what we have to go through and what else we have to do to, to overcome. Like, for example, a uh, long, long time ago, I can't remember the exact year, but if everyone understands uh, the, the plight of Emmett Till, he was 16 years old when he was beaten, killed, by a few white men for allegedly whistling at a white woman. Now, at, a, at 16 years old, that I couldn't imagine. My oldest is 10. So the fear and also the knowledge that I have, I have to decipher that in a way that it gets into them in a non-threatening way. So for example, if I have when my son my oldest son turned 16. That's a conversation I want to already have with him about what happened in the past and how right now we still deal with very similar things. And that's kind of scary because that was before I was even born. And the men that did that to him got away with it. They were not law enforcement with a lot of stuff we have to deal with, with the law enforcement, but they were normal citizens. So when my sons go out the house, as well as my daughters, I want them to not be afraid of what they see and what they have around them, but to have the tools to use it and, and build a better future in this country as well as the world, from here to the UK, Germany, everywhere. And another thing I wanted to talk about was that it's not really racism that I feel that I deal with. Because being here in El Paso, Texas, we have a very, very large Hispanic population. And it's not black on brown. It's not black, brown versus white. It's good versus evil. 
and everybody that's here in this Zoom call and everybody that's watching, we all are have to give energy to the good. And it's like we have to put on our armor for our kids. We have to each day, each month, each year, give them more armor to improve on what the past was. And over here in America, the, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed. If for those that don't know, that gave equal rights to Black Americans. And we still feel disenfranchised, which is unfortunate, but it's, it's an ongoing battle. So I hope that when my kids grow up, the knowledge that I give them, the actual history that I give them, they pass it on to my grandkids and so forth, as well as I can't get into all of the, the other stuff on my mind, but as far as generational wealth, that, that that's a whole nother conversation. That right there, white men and women that are born in America, most of them statistically already have a, a wealth basically in their, in their back pocket before they're even old enough to spend it themselves. So that is one of the most important things I have. I invest in the stock market. That's one of the things I do to generate wealth. And I can't wait to pass on that knowledge to my children because they really don't explain the stock market and, and big business and stuff like that. Most, most of it is run by white America. Whether it be good or evil, they don't like to explain that stuff to them. So for my kids, there's going to be stock market books, civil rights books, all of that. So I'll close my statement. If, if there's anything else, if, if it comes back to me later on, I got more stuff I want to talk about. But like I said, I appreciate y'all overseas that actually even care, even give a damn about us over here. I really appreciate that. No, TB, like, to be honest, it's so, like, we, we see a lot of stuff um, from America on the news. Um, but to talk to you, someone that's actually there in Texas, like, we appreciate it so much, seriously. So the thanks is with you. It's not with us. The thanks is with you, man. And thanks for joining us. I've got a quick question. After, um, after what's happened with George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, does it feel different? Is that, is that your dog? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, does it feel different to this today to, like, two weeks ago? Uh, actually, it does, but not necessarily for for me. It's for, it's for other people, which was was kind of because this hasn't not, not much has changed, you know. As far as the last five years, when you go back to Eric Garner, you go back to um, uh, man, escapes me. Um, ah, the hoodie. Somebody else <laughs> in the comments. Uh, hood Trayvon Martin. Yes in Florida, Trayvon Martin was uh, killed by George Zimmerman, you know, trying to take the law to his own hands. And it hasn't really changed much for me. I'm still feel like I have to teach my kids the same things. It's just more awareness for everybody else. Like when I see my friends that aren't black around here, like I said, in this Hispanic community, I've gotten so many questions they they feel for me, and a lot of them haven't really paid attention until now. You know, the the murder, basically, what we witnessed of of ah, man, it's the murder. Like it, it's basically murder on, te on 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 camera by a police officer. You know, I got pulled over a couple of weeks ago, and I was just just all we do is just think about those names, those people that we see over and over again, get taken advantage of. So to go back to your question, not for me much, it's more for everybody else. Cause I, I think honestly, because of the coronavirus, people are home a lot more. There's 30 million people in America that have applied for unemployment, probably millions more that don't even know how to apply for unemployment. So there's a lot of unrest, pockets are low, and they're, everybody's paying attention. They're, they're zoned in, no sports. So, yeah, I just have to stay diligent. And, and I try not to get angry. And I explain to, to people what's going on with as much level head and, and knowledge as possible. So I guess if, if you want to say what's changed, to me, I have to be more diligent. And I'm, I'm a very nonviolent person. 
though the looting I don't support, but I understand. Destroying property, all that stuff, I don't I don't agree, but I understand that some people are just completely fed up. Oh, powerful, man. That's powerful. We appreciate it so much. And um, people have been asking for you know, the speakers to share their links. So please do share your, your links and your resources in the chat. But that was that was so powerful to hear you speak, TB. And I'm sure that we're, we're going to come to you for questions when we get to the Q&A section. But yeah, thank you so much, bro. I appreciate it so much, man. Okay, Absolutely. we're going to come back to the UK now. And uh, we have Dr. Pragya Agarwal. And uh, she is a behavioral scientist, a diversity consultant, and author of a recently published book, Sway, Un Unraveling Unconscious Bias, which is out in the US and the UK with Bloomsbury. She's a two-time TEDx speaker, organizer of the first TEDx women in the, in the Northwest of the UK, founder of research think tank, Think 50% Project, and the South Asian Literary Festival, after, after more than 12 years as a senior academic in US and UK universities, she is now a freelance journalist and writes on gender and racial inequalities and parenting for various publications such as Forbes, Guardian, Independent, Huffington Post, Prospect, and more. She has three, three children and lives in the Northwest of the UK with her family. I don't know how you do all that, but you do a lot. <laughs> um, so big up to you, congratulations, but we wanna hear you, you know, your views on, on your, the conversations you've had and how you've approached that with your the children around race. Are you still there? After that big introduction as well. Okay. Well, I saw her, I saw her on the call a minute ago. <laughs> so so we'll, we'll come back to her. I'm sure she's here somewhere. I'll have to repeat all that when she joins later. <laughs> okay, um, someone I do know on my screen is, is Natalie. Uh, so Natalie, I asked Natalie for a bio and she told me she was a London-based freelance graphic designer, an unimpressed observer of UK politics and the UK in general. And Natalie is prolific on Twitter. It's the first time we've seen each other video to video, but you, your tweets are... are um, they should be framed on your wall <laughs> as, as good knowledge. So I had to get you to speak. So Natalie, welcome. Hi, can, mic check. Can everyone hear me? Am I clear? Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, I did wonder why you were, <laughs> why you invited me on. Basically, I rant on Twitter <laughs> in a very fed up manner, just shaking my head, looking unimpressed. I don't know if everyone saw um, Boris Johnson genuinely go on a press conference and beg European workers to come back to the UK. And he even spoke a little Italian and you just think, what, what on earth is going on? So uh, uh, this, this incident, everything that's happened this week, I've tried to carry on and really think about what, I was going to say for this, Elliot, when you invited me to this, because you said be kind in this conversation and I will try, and I thought you were speaking to me a little bit. <laughs> so not everyone, to, not just you, Natalie. Yes, but I'm going to, but because you've seen my tweets and you see how much fire is in them, because I am fed up, in all seriousness, I am incredibly fed up. And I, 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 even now, even right now, I doubt how much, how real to even talk because I've had so many experiences of saying the truth as I see it, my experience and being silenced or told that it's not so bad. Even the clip of Newsnight, I don't know if anyone Britain, in Britain saw it, of Emily Maitlis interviewing George the Poet. And after he spoke and talked about police brutality in this country, she genuinely said, oh, but it's not so bad in this country, is it? Because the police don't have guns here. And he just went... And you, you felt it. You felt it. Because... It's not, as somebody rightly pointed out, George Floyd did not die from a gun. 
you do not have to die from a gun to be a victim of racism. And this is bigger than police brutality. Most of us are not going to die from police brutality. We're going to die from a thousand cuts of the racism that we have to suffer every day, sorry. It's the, being, it's, it's the strategies we have to develop to protect our mental health. And when you asked me about this, I thought about what I told myself when I was younger, because I was tired of going from this mental cycle of frustration to anger to confusion, because I'm a person of logic. Racism is illogical. The whole structure of white supremacy is, is illogical. It is based on unfairness. And we are raised to believe that this country is fair and fairness and cricket and everything like that. So why is it still happening? And I'm sure any of you, I, I'm sorry, I don't have children, but I'm sure if you're dealing with younger people, they will ask you, why is it still, still happening? It is embarrassing that we are still having to prepare our children and telling them, you know, you will have to work 10 times harder to get half as much. Why in 2020 are we still saying that? Why are we still telling our children to repress their natural instinct to react to unfairness when a police officer stops them and lies that there is weed coming, a smell coming from their car. We've seen the video footage. Why are we still having to do that? Why, when I travel on the tube, am I assaulted by, and I'm sorry, to, I apologize now for anyone's feelings. I'm assaulted on the tube. I've been kicked. I've been, I've had my arm crushed. I've had been elbowed several, so many times. And um, you have to sit there and make the choice. Do I say something or do I push back? And you know, when I pushed back one time when a woman crushed my arm, another woman yelled at me to get off her. Why am I, this is a few years ago. Why is this still happening? I would, implore young people to educate themselves as to why seemingly nice people can appease, excuse and maintain white supremacy and racist structures. Read the books, study, study books, study people. My mother always used to tell me when I was growing up, observe, observe, observe. And we have a phrase, you've got two eyes, and two ears and one mouth for a reason. Use your eyes and your ears twice as much. And you will learn an awful lot. There is a book by an author called Jonathan Metzel. It's called Dying of Whiteness. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. He has given speeches to promote it on YouTube and you can find it. And there is one where at the beginning he is interrupted by a group of protesters. You can guess they weren't wearing MAGA hats, but you could guess where, where they're from. And sorry if I've already gone over the four minutes, but I'm speaking passionately here. And he said the reason why he interviewed white people, some white men, and they said they didn't want an NHS style service. I don't want my tax dollars going to welfare queens and Hispanics. And he said these men are dying of their illnesses. And his white liberal friends can understand it. And he said, but you've got to understand, these men are willing to die in order to maintain that privilege. How many principles are you prepared to die for? Because we don't understand it, we can't fight it. And if you don't understand it, you can't build strategies to help you understand it and to help retain your mental health. This is crucial. This is why in both our countries, in the US and the UK, we suffer from more mental health incidences. And in the UK, we end up being arrested more often under the Mental Health Act. And there is no connection between racism and stress. 
In the COVID-19 reports, one of the things that's associated with making it worse for us is hypertension. What causes hypertension? You saw I said before that it was released, I said, I bet they're going to blame diabetes as a reason for why we're dying more often. And diabetes is a cause of hypertension, but hypertension is another way of saying high blood pressure. What causes high blood pressure? Stress. What causes stress for us? Being victims of racism. So I'm going to finish with this. This is going to be a really long fight. This is a 500 year old habit that we're asking a certain demographic to break. And I'm afraid none of us are going to be alive to see the finish, but we're going to have to start now so that our children suffer it less and our grandchildren suffer it less because what you saw was the collective knee on our necks for 500 years. It is not the police brutality. So please don't ask me to forget slavery. I wear the surname of a slave owner and a rapist. So I cannot forget slavery. It's on every piece of government ID I own. I do not want to be told that the UK is less racist. It's still racist. In fact, the UK exported white supremacy. How do you think it got there in the US in the first place? There are programs to educate you about Scotland's part in the KKK. It's, we have the internet, it's a beautiful thing. I, I, I want to speak as if I'm speaking to my white friend. We still have to have the discussion. I'm really sorry this is going to hurt your feelings. I don't apologize. But I have to say it. It's not, it's not the police. It's not these massive incidences. We have to have the discussions about how we're going to survive you. How we're going to survive you. It's how you vote. We wanted you here to vote. Well, I say we, I'm, I apologize for representing one of us, I don't. But certainly I would have liked people to vote out a party that continued Windrush. I can't tell you the stress I had when my mother went off to Jamaica and I begged her, do you have your citizenship papers? She's been here over 60 years. Why am I having to do that? Because people vote in a way that harms us, and they don't think. P please, now is the time to listen and learn. Learn the true history of the UK. Learn to listen to us, please don't lecture me anymore. What, I'm not a fantasist. We can't all be making it up. So please help us so that our next generation don't have to think, why are they calling me aggressive or angry when I'm not even raising my voice? I'm, I'm tired, I'm fed up. Get on with it now. We can't, as James Corden gave a speech, if anyone saw it and he talked to Reggie and he broke down. We cannot cure an addiction we don't have. Give up the addiction now. Natalie, thank you. And I, knew, I know your, your voice needs to be heard. And there's a lot of people on this call that registered just to listen and i'm so glad they did and i'm so glad that you you spoke because i think people need to hear what you have to say um so thank you for spending that i know these things are tiring but thank you for your energy um and being so honest and i think that hit a lot of people 
Thanks so much, Natalie. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back over to the US. And Devin, I can see Devin there. Um, Devin D. Coleman is an, is an author and public speaker whose work embodies the art of turning tragedy into triumph. He's a single father to one daughter. Devin served as an executive board member on the Florida Rights of Restoration Coalition, a volunteer board member for the Duval Regional Juvenile Detention Center Advisory Council. Devin, man, you've got to be working hard here. There's some acronyms. Served on the Client Anniversary Advisory Board of Jacksonville Area Legal Aid, Chairman of the Fatherhood Initiative Task Force. He currently serves on the station statewide maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting program steering committee. And his new book, Turning the Curve, will be released late August 2020. So welcome, Devin. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. Um, hearing you like read my bio, I want to say one thing. I felt I had to say that, and that's sad because a lot of brothers feel like they have to list their accomplishments to be valued by our audience. So for me, when we talk about parity and equality, is when you value me just on my face, right? And sticking with the theme, talking about how do we talk about these issues with our children, um, I've had to do that, uh, like some of the other speakers from a very young age. So I start with my story. Um, Jacksonville, Florida, born and raised. And, you know, I went to college and ended up catching a felony offense and went to prison. And because of that, the residual effects of that affected my child. And when we're talking about the times that we in, we're talking about this conversation sparked by a brother that lost his life over an accusation, right? And in 2004, I was hogtied and in front of my family. Now, I tried to kick the windows out of the police car. So I see why they hogtied me. But again, in 2018, I was the victim of an accident and had a gun pulled on me by uh, a highway patrolman. And my mother called, my mother was on the scene. She called 911. The person that hit me called 911. And my stepfather ran across the street and pleaded with the officer not to shoot me. And when I was local, the police and sheriff department came up, they pleaded like, don't shoot him because I didn't do anything to deserve to be shot. And the thing is, what I'm, think what I'm thinking about in this time is no matter what anybody done, they deserve their day in court, right? So we got to get people to be able to make it to court. And when I talked to my child about it, I laid historical context. So I let her see movies like Selma. They talk about our history. Um, I let her see movies about like um, uh, The Hate You Give. Because after that, she has her own organic questions. And I'm able to have a conversation with her on her, on her level about the questions that she has based on her experiences in the life that she's living, right? And it all centers around accountability. Like we got to hold each other accountable for our thoughts and our deeds. Even right now, a lot of people are saying things, but what are you going to do to create the change on the day-to-day -day, day -day basis? Talking about responsibility. Um, and also we talk about solutions, right? Like, yeah, I went through what I went through, and that's done. It's nothing that can take that back, back. Nothing that can change that trauma, right? So what can I do moving forward? What can other people do moving forward to ensure that nobody else experiences that level of mistreatment? And I think we're in an opportunity right now, like in spaces like this, just across the world, what I'm seeing is, all right, everybody tired of it on both sides of the fence. So the leadership, and we are leaders, we need to start talking about what our solutions are. So what are the solutions to ensure that people feel like they can walk outside and be safe or feel like they can be inside and be safe, right? 
we got to be able to craft our message. A lot of us on here are writers and communicators. And one of the th main things about communication is making sure when you're speaking, the audience that you're speaking to understands what you're trying to, what you're trying to convey. Think about it. A lot of us, it's our nature that become defensive, right? So we got to communicate in a manner where the people that we're talking to don't become defensive because that doesn't get us to the solution. So it's about um, defining what leadership is too. Like when you're in a position of leadership, you're supposed to think outside of yourself and think about the collective because that's what you signed up for when you say you want to be a leader. And we got to start holding our leaders accountable not only for their thoughts, but their actions and their resumes and things of that nature. And I implore all our, all the parents on this call, like, listen just as much as you talk to your children. Because I know with the experiences that I experienced, it's still a little bit different for my daughter. And things are moving so much faster. My daughter seen me get denied housing because of mistakes that I made in the past. My daughter seen me have to work twice as hard. So it's about understanding where we come from, understanding where we at, and then creating steps to get where we're trying to go. Wicked. Thanks, Devin, man. Whereabouts are you based? I'm in the United States, Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah, thanks, thanks, man. Um, as I said to TB, like you guys join us from America, it helps us in the UK understand more. We just see the news. Um, so hearing, hearing from you guys and hearing your experiences and that crazy experience that a lot of us, you know, probably wouldn't even be able to imagine. Um, but you're here and you're, you're needed and you're strong and you're a voice that needs to be heard, man. So respect. Thanks so much for joining. And no doubt we're going to come back to you as well in the questions. So we're going to go to, come back to the UK and then we're going to have uh, some questions and answers and comments. So if you do have something to say, just keep it literally to a minute. If you've got something to say, um, use the, the raise hand feature and we'll try and get to you. And Matt is on guard. He's going he's gonna to read out a couple of the, the comments, the juicy comments in the, in the chat board. Okay. So we're going to come back to the UK and I actually didn't ask for bios from people that I know. And I probably should have done that. Um, but Elijah is on the call with us and I met Elijah when, when we were both speaking at an event um, around race actually because Elijah is an author he's just written a book called The Clapback which I think came out late last year um, really good book which takes, breaks down um, kind of well I'll let Elijah talk, talk about the book um, but he's also a PR manager for Google as well and he's a, he's a great guy a great speaker um, and a really genuine person. So I'm so happy Elijah's here to talk to us. So, Elijah. Hello, um, you. can you hear me? You can. Excellent. Uh, hello, everyone. It's good to, to, to see you all virtually and to, to hear your stories. Um, as Elliot mentioned, uh, I'm an author. My book came out last year. It's called The Clapback. Um, and essentially what I wanted to do is to arm our community with responses to negative stereotypes. I, I wanted our community to be able to respond to um, allegations, stereotypes, any sort of criticism with the kind of wealth of knowledge and understanding that I know exists within our community. So um, I'm really grateful that that came out uh, last year with the paperback out. Uh, earlier this year and that there's been numerous discussions about it. Um, so Elliot approached me to just say a couple of words on what I think are the opportunities and to just provide some advice uh, where I can on how we can talk to children and, and young people about race. Uh, and I'm in a slightly awkward position of not having uh, any kids, so I, I, I don't know how much weight my words will carry, but obviously I have young people in my life that uh, I'm responsible for, sort of socially, spiritually, mentally, so um, hopefully I can share 
some of the advice that I have and some of the lessons that I've learned along the way, just because everything is, everything is a lesson. Um, I think even from a very young age and, and from the youngest age where children start to recognize that people uh, are different from them, I think <coughs> when you need to start talking to them about race and it's, it's as important to not shy away from it as you would try not to shy away from any other uncomfortable truth. So like when you're talking about death in the family, that's a very unfortunate, that's a very uncomfortable truth, but it is still important to engage with, with your children or the young people in your life. So it, it's very sort of important to treat race with the same honesty, but with the same sensitivity that you would speaking to anyone uh, uh, about death. The other thing that I would advise is that to start picking on sentences that even for young children may not seem to be about race, but subconsciously is. Things like, oh, he looks funny. Her hair is funny. You know, at a very young age, children start to notice the differences between themselves and other people. You know, their skin color is, is funny or it's different. And that presents another opportunity to be able to say to children, yes, he is different to you because of this, because of this heritage. And then leading to a discussion about different does not mean better or different does not mean worse. And these are really, really sort of easy concepts for children to, to sort of pick up because, um, you know, I've seen this great quote online a, a lot saying like, you know, we are not born with racism. That's something that is learned. Um, and then you start to move into, as your kids start getting older, it's very important to talk to them about history, especially like the history of our heritage. And I, I'm using that generally as members of the black community. I know there's some people with African history. I know there's some people with Caribbean history, lots of different histories. Um, and for our brothers and sisters in the States as well, who I know that you know, they may not have as direct um, sort of families in Africa or the Caribbean as well. Like our history is a shared history. You know, black history is a shared history. And so it's very important to talk to them about our history and how we've got to where we were today. And then it now moves on to the slightly uncomfortable conversations, right? Because there is no way that you can talk about our history without talking about the atrocities that were done to us. And that can be a very difficult conversation to have with young people because children are naturally inquisitive and the first thing that they usually ask is but why but why did they do that to us and it's not for us to try and get into the mentality of our oppressors you know it's not for us to try and explain the worst things that were ever done to us and for us it's our ability to explain that that is wrong but also to talk about how we've persevered, how we've struggled, how we've pushed past the restrictions that were put on us to survive today, to be fantastic today, to be great today, and how we're still facing those challenges. Um, another thing that I think is really important to do is set an example. Set an example in your activism, set an example in your volunteering, and then as soon as your children and the young people in your life are able to start participating in that, it's very important to take them along. You know, for, uh, I'm Nigerian, and so in my family, the concept, of, the concept of there being like your nuclear family doesn't kind of exist. You know, everyone is an uncle, everyone's an auntie. Um, and showing up for other members of your community, even though they're not sort of blood related, I think is very, very important. Um, so kind of that setting example and to the activism um, and I'm running out of time so I'll just kind of speed it up. I think it's also important to talk about the events that are happening in the news, not just today but sort of currently, is really really important to sort of provide additional context to your children because the news media doesn't do that, right? And how often do you look at the news media, uh, at, at the media or the news and see people who look like us represented. So it's always very important to provide context. And, and I grew up in a house of books. So the final thing is just get books about 
you know, how to be anti-racist, get books by black and brown writers, get books that just provide more of an insight into, into sort of how to be anti-racist um, and also kind of reflect that in all of their leisure activities, in the toys that they have, in the groups that they attend. Um, and just to kind of end it all or wrap it all is that parents know best at what age to have these conversations. Like you can't have someone else tell you, you know, who or at what age you should start having these conversations. Like parents should trust their instincts. Um, obviously you want what's right for your child. So it's never too early is my general instinct. But of course, you know, you don't want to traumatize a, a young kid. So um, hopefully those words of uh, wisdom sort of resonate. And yeah, thank you so much for your time and, and for listening. Uh, thank you, Elijah. And on the theme of books, go and buy Elijah's, Elijah's book, The Clapback. Uh, we'll put a link in, in the chat. But thank you, Elijah. Some really um, practical tips there. Um, and things that I can definitely relate to and resonate with. So thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna open it up. So if you do wanna just comment or reflect on anything you've heard, um, keep it to a minute. Just use the hand feature and we'll come to you. Uh, but first we're gonna go to Matt, who's gonna read out a few of the, the comments um, that we've had in the, in the chat room. So, so Matt, what's, what's caught your eye in there? There hasn't really been that many questions as such. There are a few conversations in there. Um, someone did ask the questions. Uh, do you have any recommend? Um, do you have a recommended list of books for kids, Elijah? Um, I'm afraid I don't have any off the top of my head. I don't really actually have a lot uh, here because, as I said, I, I don't <laughs> I, I, I don't have kids. But what I could do is uh, do a little bit of research and then I can share it with um, with Elliot to share with the group, so I can commit to doing that for you. all you got some homework. <laughs> Miles, what else is in there, Matt? Um, someone's got, a, someone's there. Donald, he wants to talk. Yes, go. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Elijah. Just briefly, um, I can set, um, so I'm part of an organization known as Reach Society. Um, and what we've produced over the last few years is a series of books, literally called the uh, Cultural Index of esteem. Uh, these are written by particularly black British writers of both Caribbean and African origin, both men and women. Um, and what we've done uh, is we've pro produced about 50 or so, and we've categorized them um, for young people, teenagers and adults. And what we've been doing over the last few years, people can recommend books um, and we'll read them. And if we think they're suitable, We've put them on our website. So we're literally developing um, a catalogue of, of books. Um, I'll send you the link. And, and what we've been doing over the last few years, particularly with young people, finally, is if any young person has read any of those books, um, we've now developed prizes and awards um, called the Rolston Dennis Index of, of Cultural Esteem. If a young person produces a summary, which is a page of one or two of those books, um, we would um, give them an award and we've been now doing that. So again, I think the point Elijah has made is, is to make uh, young people aware uh, of the many great works and literature that, that are around. I'll, I'll send folks the link. Great. Thank you, Thank you Donald. Thanks so much. So Matt, should we take another comments or, or, or questions in there? Uh, someone sent over a recommendation of a book um, by the name of DJ and the book's called I Am Truly. Just quickly went on Amazon and yeah, it seems pretty decent. <laughs> Sorry, I kind of didn't win here. So we've got I Am Truly and it seems to be a, bo a, a book with a black girl on the front of it. So it's nice to have a book where children can see themselves in the book because unfortunately as as you sort of are a parent, you start looking at things. If your child is of a different colour and you don't see many books that represent your child in the books, you don't want them to feel away. way. So it's really important to have that. So thank you very much, DJ, for that. Um, yeah, and then obviously we've got a couple links in the chat. So I think it's worth everyone to have a look at the chat. 
and look at the links that have been put in there by everyone. So thank you very much. But no other questions as such. Great. Thanks, Matt. So, so Rowena, you got your hand up. Hey, Rowena, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to just um, say the book that, because um, I've got a daughter who's 14. Sorry for those of you who don't know. I, my name's Rowena. I've got um, two children. One's three and the other one's 14. Um, at the moment, she's reading this book. I don't know if you can see it. So it's Malcolm X's autobiography. It's actually um, one of my favourite books because it just it really sort of takes you through his journey of being an activist. Um, and there's a lot of people that might, I don't know, that might um, feel that it's quite strong because it covers um, quite a lot of racism. But I just feel that it really covers sort of everything from, you know, like the journey from um, the amount of oppression that everyone had before they got um, the right to vote in America that was in 1964 um, but this is I would say I'd recommend this book for anyone who's got teenagers who are maybe um, it depends on your child really um, you know how mature your child is but for my child um, from 14 she's reading this book and I would say it's it just really opens your eyes about um, racism and how it affects us and people just automatically maybe think that Malcolm X is quite a, you know, he was pro-violence. He, um, you know, throughout the book, he does sort of, um, sort of grow and he's not so, you know, he's not so violent anymore, like towards the end of the book. But this book would be one of my recommended books, I'd say, Great. For, for teenagers. Thank you, Ro. Great yeah. share. Um, okay. Natalie, you've got your, your hand up. Do you want to come in? Second. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, I just I just wanted to ask because I, I know we, we have different groups of people, but but I, I don't know if this is going to be raised in other points. But I wanted to know from any any um, white speakers or anything like that, how have they found having discussions about race um, recently or in the past? because I can certainly appreciate how difficult it is, if, especially if you're dealing with someone in your family who is racist. So I just wanted to know how they are finding it and what they thought when they saw the video. How did they, they feel? I, I personally, obviously I've heard a lot of black people speak about it, but I would really like to hear actual voices about how, how some white people felt about it. So, so that would be interesting for me. Thank you, Natalie. So if anyone would like to come in, um, feel free. As we said at the beginning, this, this is a safe space, so please be confident to, to speak up. Um, so Alex, did you want to come in? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? We can, yes. Cool, hi everyone. Um, thanks for this, it's been really good. Um, I found it particularly challenging, to be honest. So I've got a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, and whilst I'm white, my kids are mixed race. And as uh, I think it was you yourself, Elliot, said earlier that it was at quite a young age when your daughter starts to be quite conscious about things like their hair. Um, but with things that have gone on now, and I think there was something on Newsround the other day um, that my wife saw, um, which we, you know, we hadn't talked to our eldest about it at this stage. And I was actually right now scribbling down a question but I didn't have time to finish it but I thought this was now a good time to come in um, because I don't I don't know what to do to a certain degree right now because I feel that I guess my question and excuse my ignorance um, if I have any on, on this point is I wonder do do black parents talk to their kids about racism from a personal experience um, because I can't do that with my mixed race kids, of course. So it is hard, basically, it would, would be my point, Natalie. It's, it's a challenge because you don't have that personal experience. But I, I think, I think so, so, I'm sorry, can I, very, very quickly. How yeah. do you find it if um, you're talking to other, if you see another white person 
expressing views that you find hurtful because obviously you have family members who have uh, black ancestry. Uh, how have you found talking to them? Because I personally have found it difficult. So I don't know if you find it difficult as well. How challenging is that? Because this, this is going to get really uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable, isn't it, to have that conversation? Yeah, to be um, fair, um, I'm fortunate enough that I don't feel I've seen or experienced it that much. However, there are times when you might hear the occasional thing or, or you can look at something and, and feel that it has racial undertones and it, it's yeah it's it's hard sometimes I think maybe maybe I'm I can be a bit of a coward with it and and I, I, might, I might not have spoken up in times when it might have been better to do so because because you feel that people might think you're making a big deal of something which otherwise you know, you know, and they might kind of think, why do you care? Why are you making such a big fuss about something that mm -hmm. is just for them, just a trivial joke that they might not even see as something racist? Um, it's, it, yeah, it's hard. I keep saying the same thing. Um, I guess I should try and be more courageous and, uh, and, and say what's on my mind, even though it might seem like a, a trivial thing to other people. Yeah, and I think the thing is, just very quickly, it, it is very difficult in this country. I've seen the comments. It's very, very subtle. I think I saw a clip where someone said, actually, it's more dangerous in this country because of the subtlety. It's the, it's the sly comments. It's the undertones. You, you know, our, our prime ministers don't have to say the words. They don't have to say the, the slurs to enact racist policies and it's fighting those and then they'll say oh I'm not racist and it's that it's, it's very tiring so I don't know um, what literature is out there to help you spot that and challenge it and be prepared for what people to, are going to say but I suppose if anyone has any of that material it would be useful to post it because you're really looking to preempt what is going to say so you're ready Thanks, Alex, and, and thanks, Natalie, as well. Alex, were you going to say something else there? No, no, no. I was just saying thank you to Natalie. That's great. Okay. Now, this is good. This is the kind of conversation we want to have. Um, so, so thank you so much, guys. So, Gemma Teal, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in? Yes. Sorry. I was unmuting myself there. I was not, I was not ready. Um, yeah, just... Um, to speak to Natalie's question again, then um, my my family are super racist. Um, I don't really know how um, I'm not super racist, although we're all racist, but not. I mean, these people are super racist, um, and it is tricky to talk to them. I've always been kind of I fun find it easier to tackle these things with my family than I do with randoms for some reason, probably just because you feel confident and you feel safe. Um, and one of the things that I found was I was picking up on small things and they didn't like it. And what they would do then would be to escalate. So I'd pull them up on something small and they would react by saying something worse. Uh, basically to bait me and um, we got to the point at one point where bait, there's well about half of them now I don't see anymore because as soon as I see them they start saying something awful um, and it is really tricky and so I got to the point where I sort of started to shy away from tackling things in other parts of life because my experience was that doing it made it worse mm. and um when we say i think when we say it's tricky it's not meant to sound like oh i don't want to do it i mean obviously no one wants to have to do it um but i found it tricky finding the right way to approach things and not make it worse and not do you know what i mean and not put someone more in an entrenched position um and if anyone has any advice on that <laughs> That would be amazing um and also just a question while i'm here is 
uh, we've got a one and a half year old and we're trying to you know using books and using well where we live as well which is quite good but just introducing to the idea that everyone's different and that's cool um but i feel like i'm like i don't know when i would start to sort of introduce to him and how the concept of being anti-racist as my little middle class white guy that i've created um so yeah so yeah that's my experience of <laughs> trying to tackle racism which is not a great one but also just you know if anyone's got any uh, ideas on how to do that without making everything worse i really would like to hear it because <laughs> i want to do the work but as it turns out i'm bad at it mm. um, but yeah thank you for everyone's time i feel kind of yeah thank, thank you Gemma. Being on this um, <laughs> we appreciate your honesty you know, to come here and say your family is racist oh mate is, they're terrible is, honestly they're horrendous but that's you know we we wanted to create that space where we could have these conversations. And if anyone has got any, um, if, if anyone's experienced that and has had conversations with their family members, um, then you know, put your hand up and share that as well. I mean, I think it's interesting that I guess over the last week or so, everyone's become very interested in these conversations and stuff. And, and that is good. Um, but I think the reality is that the hard work, the work is hard and um, the work is not easy and it's not sexy and it's not, on social media and it does fracture relationships and um, we need to be willing sometimes unfortunately um, for relationships to be fractured even if we try our best to navigate conversations in the right way um, but if anyone has any more specific advice <laughs> or experience then feel free to share that um, but we have okay so we're going to go to Lisa's gonna put a hand up to come to you in a sec um, and I think AKM, you've got your hand up as well. So we'll go to you um, and we'll go to Matt and then we'll, we'll kind of continue back to the second lot of speakers, okay? So Lisa, over to you. Hi, um, so when, when I was telling my daughter who's 10 um, about everything that was happened, um, I found it really upsetting. And so her initial reaction was to get really upset as well. Um, and, and then, you know, she sort of was saying, well, well what can we do? Um, and she has seen me in the past sort of deal with, um, I, I guess, some of the more sort of microaggressions, you know, so a taxi driver sort of saying something about another driver, you know, but with a sort of racist undertone, even something like my mum has said, that kind of thing. So, so I sort of said to her, you know, to watch out for these things. And um, I said to her as well, you know, she has some um, BAME friends at school. And I said that, you know, the, 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 the sad situation is that, you know, in, in many circumstances, um, her voice will be listened to more than theirs will. Um, and I said, you know, so something that's really important is that if she sees them feel uncomfortable, um, that she makes them feel safe when they're in those sort of really difficult situations when somebody says something to them it's her job to stand up for them and to be their voice if they're finding it difficult to do so um, and, and that's the sort of message that I'm giving her as a 10 year old um, and, and that's the sort of thing that I want to build on is you know these sort of small steps that kids can take and then they get their courage from taking the sort of small steps so they can do a little bit more. Okay. Good advice thank you Lisa. Okay AKM over to you. Thanks, Elliot. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Alice. Sorry, I just have to use my initials <laughs> at work, so uh, it's very formal. Um, I I am a parent, but I'm of a of a very young son. I'm here more in a capacity um, as a deputy head in a um, in a boys' school, which is in right in the centre of London, um, and I'm responsible for all things pastoral, so everything from behaviour. So obviously racism is, as we know, is an issue everywhere, but also the welfare of the boys. Um, and I am working in a really, really, really diverse, genuinely diverse community. I know all schools like to say, oh, we're a really diverse institution. We really, really are. Um, and it's just been a really, really difficult week for obvious reasons. Um, and we've got a very strong um, BAME community uh, and a very, I think, loud, um, boys within particularly the um, our ACS community as well. But I'm trying to have conversations with staff and with colleagues who are BAME and obviously the children who are at the start of it 
but we're teaching 950 boys over the internet and it's really really difficult and I think um Kirsty, I was really grateful for um your input at the beginning because there's some really sage advice there but um I suppose my I, I just feel deeply conflicted for so many different reasons but I suppose any yeah the difficulty is is exacerbated and I'm just really interested if anyone has any sort of thoughts about how we can um manage the situation when we're dealing with young people um working remotely with them because we all know that when children are alone in their rooms managing these things which all of the boys in my community are um they don't feel it, it's the small nuanced conversations that that i'm missing out of uh, missing out on and, and trying to manage classes of 30 and have discussion which would normally be really vibrant and easy to manage because you can see the body language and, and hear the inflection in their voices and, and all of that is gone and it's really really difficult so i've had a tough week and i've also obviously got boys who are angry and they're sad and they're suffering and they're confused um so this has been so useful and i feel like i've just sort of vented as, as part of it but <laughs> it's a difficult situation to manage so thank you for for your advice and for listening and, and i'm really open to yeah to any suggestions but also here to, to offer support as well in my capacity as an educator because I think we need to look really really carefully at the curriculum um great and that's thank, you, problem. Problem. thank you so if anyone has any um specific advice around that question then feel free to to come in um and, and we'll try and answer that, that question for you Alice as well so we've got two more people um Samya and Crystal please do keep your comments short um because we're going to go to the to the next speaker soon. So Samya, do you want to come in now? Hi, can you hear me? We can, yeah. Hello, yes. yes. Hi, uh, yes, I'm older. Uh, I'm just over 60, I'd say. And um, I'm Anglo-Sudanese, so I'm mixed. I'm one of those first generation people who was mixed. And I was actually born in Sudan, but I've been to many different countries because of my parents' um, jobs. So I've been privileged to live in different cultures. And I'd say one good book to read for people is uh, Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom, because it's really impactful in terms of his experience and how um, things actually happened in his life. I found that a very useful book. Um, also, I think racism to me, having listened to this, and it's the first time really I've heard a discussion in England about racism. I've heard it in lots of different spheres. Um, it's, it just seems to me, it's just gelled in my mind that it's a kind of evil or nastiness, just like any other nastiness. And it's just that history has exploited it in many different ways, policies, etc. Uh, for getting power over lands, people, groups, whatever. Um, maybe it's a, just been a convenient way of dividing people um, in different circumstances. And I think in my experience, as well as far as family are concerned, you really just have to push back with individuals who are being nasty, whether it's racism or anything else. And at the end of the day, they'll come back to you if you're talking the truth and they're courageous enough to come back to you and you just have to be the best human being you can be and uh, somebody at work said to me the higher you build your walls the taller I become and I'm also I have faith and I believe that we're not test we're, we're tested to the to, um, we're we're tested by God uh, but not beyond our own uh, beyond, not beyond our limits so I believe that everything happens for a reason. And I think it's very important to turn negatives around in your life. And I think everybody should seek to do that. And that's why we're here. And I think that uh, white racism or any racism, because it can be experienced by, um, you know, by individuals, white people in black settings as well, as I know. Um, I think it's ignorance and it's think it's based upon people's limited experience and it's not just about history or educating people in schools it's also about morality that is very absent 
from our lives nowadays because we're all geared towards economic well-being, not so much um, spiritual, emotional well-being, but we're being forced to do that because mental health has now collapsed. So I think it's really about history adjusting itself so that we can all be nicer and better people to, our, to each other and also to ourselves and to allow ourselves to flourish more fully to be the people that we're meant to be rather than how we're limited. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Really, really nice words. Thanks so much. Um, Crystal, let's go over to you. Hi. Can you see me? Oh. Hi, yeah. You're right. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I just want you to speak quickly. Um, I'm a um I'm a school teacher, I've been a science teacher for 15 years. Um, and obviously I've been working with teenagers and young people for a long time. Um, I want to say something about the way that um it's possible that young people will be processing a lot of what's going on and that we need to be aware. Um a lot of it may materialise, and I know there was a deputy head teacher on um, not too long ago. A lot of it might materialise in anger, because if you think about it, we're grown up, we're, we can reason it out, we can be logical, we can sit down and have a philosophical discussion about race and class and whatever else. But as a te especially as a teenager, a lot of it is going to materialise as anger and as frustration. And um, it is difficult. It's a shame that schools aren't open at the moment because obviously that would be a way that teachers could sort of foster those discussions and help support young people. But one thing that we could do um, and something that I have done because I've, um, in the school that I've taught in 15 years, I don't know, for 10 years, sorry, um, I regularly did the Black History Month assembly. And in that, I never, ever, ever, ever did slavery. I never did, um, you're a victim, this is what happened to you, you were abused again, you were oppressed again, this person oppressed you in this way, and all the details of how it happened. I always went back to um, African history and African kingdoms, and um, a good resource for um, teachers out there or people who have um, young young black people in their midst or young um, mixed race children in their midst is to go to a website called When We Ruled. Um, it's where you'll find a lot of the work by Robin Walker. And if you don't even buy any of his books that are available on Amazon, um, if you go onto the website, there are a hundred facts about African history. And I've given presentations on those. And one thing I found is that teenagers afterwards will come up to me, people, ch ch children who normally don't engage, they will come up to me and they will say, wow, I can't believe that. And you can see that the, their, their chest, you know, their shoulders are going back and they're feeling proud and I want to learn more. Oh my gosh. And what we need to do at this moment in time is to let young people know that black people didn't, we were not born into, um, oppression that you know the historical tra trajectory of black children who are younger needs to be a lot broader than it's presented in school for example so we can't start at you know we were brought on the sh on the ship we need to go back further because they need to know about their po positive Af african history and that goes back to what um Kersey said earlier on about the cultural confidence I think it was which is just spot on and this is part of that but I think we need to deal with that probably a little bit of anger and frustration that would be going on and um, maybe going and looking at a book called Black History Matters by Robin Walker um, it's actually it's a children's book or just going onto the website would um, just help them to positive to um, focus on the positives of black history also I would say um, to that deputy head who was on earlier I think a really good way of um, you know managing one of your classrooms I don't know if you're using that like, Google Classroom or Zoom or whatever um, to do your remote teaching but having a uh, finding a visit video about um, African history or something quite uh, positive 
and then having or, or something to do with what's going on and then letting them just watch the clip and then come together and discuss it might be a nice way just to get conversation going remotely um and that was just an idea i was thinking so i just wanted to share that with you all Thanks. Great. Thanks, Crystal. And when you first came on, I didn't recognise your name. So hello. <laughs> you're right. You're right, Elliot. I'm good. I'm good. Hope you're well. Cool. Hope Ronaldo's good too. Thanks for yeah, that. Yeah, he's so, good. Um, Thanks. That's, that's really good direct kind of advice for Alice as well. So it's, it's great to be able to, to be able to share that, that immediate advice. That's really good. Okay. Yeah. So well, that, was, that, was, that was great. Thanks so much, everyone, for your, for your input. Um, it's 10 o'clock now. For those that have stamina and energy, we're going to keep going. If you need to drop off, if you're tired, I understand you can leave. Um, but we're going to be here for a little bit longer. We've got some really good people to hear from as well. So if you can, please stay with us. because We want to hear from um, some more people in the UK and US and other places too. So the next person I'm going to introduce is um, Isha John Johnson. Um, Isha is a professional counsellor with over 25 years experience in her profession. She's the former senior sexual abuse counselor for the Bernardos, qualified play therapist and parent coach, and now works in partnership with Birmingham Counseling Services, as well as having her own luminous counseling. Her counseling services include emotional well-being, sexual abuse, bereavement, mental health and anxiety, and couples counseling. And I actually know Isha's um, daughter who recommended Isha to me. Um, <laughs> great, she used to work at CBBs. I'm not quite sure if she's still there now. She is. Um, <laughs> but thanks, thanks to your daughter for recommending you come and speak to us. So Isha, please take, take the floor. Thank you, Alex, for having me. And um, just saying good evening to all the panel and everyone who's listening. Um, I have to condense this um, in such a short time. I actually have a webinar coming up next Thursday where I'll be talking to um, parents on a broader level into using practical solutions. Um, it's okay to go out and buy books and and by other authors, so there's plenty out there, there's plenty on Amazon as um, things have unraveled, uh, more and more books have come on the market all of a sudden. So if you go on Amazon, there's lots of books that's talking to young people and um, children about, about racism. But um, I want to give you some practical tools that you can use like now, using the equipment in your house like now. I'm a creative um, counselor and I work on paper a lot, especially with teenagers. And um, there's very few um, black girls I meet that actually like themselves. They don't like their head and like their nose. There's very few that I meet that don't, that they don't they, that like themselves. But by the time I finish with them, they go out knowing who they are. Because I'm the counselor that takes the glitter of all the poo, okay? I don't mess about. So when they come in, I, I break all the rules because you're going out and you're going to know who you are. And one of the things I ask the young people when they come in, how much value do you put on yourself? And they give me a number and I says, never you do that. Okay. So ask me the question. And they ask me, and I said, I am priceless. When I walk in the room, I command the room. And that's how I want young people to walk in the room. You command the room. You know who you are. Yeah. I've done the books, I'm over 60. So I've done the books, I've done the marches. I know I look good, I do, yeah? I have three children, 141, 129, and 126, yeah? Very successful girls who know who they are. And when I like when children come to me, I treat them as I would like my children to be treated. So I know they're gonna get results when they come in. So I just want to give um, you some very practical tools um, of how to work with your children using the tools that you have in your home. So one of the things I'll say to parents who are listening, make sure you've got crayons, felt tips, and paper in your house. Always have paper in your home. A2, A3, whatever, always have paper there so that you can scribble on. That's the easiest thing and the easiest way to work with children is through cre a creative medium. And also having simple things like um that will take their minds off when you're talking to them it'll take their minds of how you know it'll take the anxiety away so if you have simple board games and when you're working with children and um, parents spend quality time with them that means no cooking turn off the tv turn off your phone switch everything up get on the table or get on the floor down to their level now I'm talking about children from as young as four now. Get on their level, switch everything off. 
Children don't care who you are, how, what qualification. I don't care what qualification you got on this line. I don't care about your accolades. They don't business. They don't care. They want to know that you were there for them. They don't care how much money you earn, that you are there for them. And I have always been there for my children 110%. I was there to take them to school and pick them up again. Find ways to do that because it can be done. It is not the school's responsibility for your child. It is yours. It starts from the home and you make sure you spend that time with them. There's too much excuse that I am busy. Yeah. Stop being busy and be there for your child. They didn't beg to be born. So you make sure you are there. Okay. Our history starts at home. Yeah. The first time my child was called a name, she was called chocolate drops. And she told the girl, it takes one and a half pint of white milk to make a bar of brown chocolate because she could hold her home at eight years old. Our children need to know who they are in this age. Yeah, hope I'm making sense. So we have to be mindful how we communicate to our children, especially our little ones. They don't understand the concept or the dynamics of racism, but they know something is going on. They would have picked up from your emotions, your stresses, your anxiety, that something is going on, but they don't know what it is. So we have to be careful and we have to do everything age appropriate to them. So you don't go out there and say somebody was murdered and this was that, you know, you don't take them back as far as slavery. They don't need that information. They need to be in the now and in the present. Yeah, children are aware. They're more aware than you think. So watch your language and watch your emotion, okay? Do not speak to your children from a position of anger. Make sure you're nice and calm. And parents, I'm telling you, look after your emotional health and well-being. You need to do that first before you even begin to address your, your children. Make sure that you're in an emotionally stable place before you begin to have that conversation with them. So as I say, the best way to work with them is by um, on paper. And the first thing you do is get a sheet of paper sit on the floor at the table with your child and find out what they already know. Find out, don't make assumptions that they don't know anything and don't make assumptions that they do, okay? Find out what they already know, find out where they, they're at, yeah? Let them tell you, don't put words in their mouth, let them tell you where they're at, what they know that has gone on. Let them explain that to you in their own vocabulary, the way they know. Young children don't always have the, the words to articulate um, how they're feeling. So that's why we work on paper to, to help them. Okay. Ask your child, put the paper and ask your child and you help them to draw themselves right in the middle, or you can do it for them to draw themselves and color themselves in and then ask them to express their feelings on paper, or you can write it. So they may be feeling, um, my tummy hurts. That's where most young children carry their feelings is inside their tummy or it's inside their heart, and they carry those emotions all over their bodies. So whatever emotions they're feeling, they may tell you that they're feeling a little bit sad, they may be feeling a little bit angry, they may be feeling a little bit confused. Well, whatever the feelings are that they're feeling, ask them to put that feeling on paper in a color that represents that. And then ask them to put a little dot on their body where they're feeling that. And you may find sometimes they feel anxiety in their head, or they may feel anxiety in their heart or they might feel anger in their fist and you might and, and keep observing them because they might double their fist to show how angry they are they may squash their toes up to show how angry they are and look at what look at um what they're putting on paper because it's it's like doing a brain dump but it's, you're putting you're giving them a visual of how they are feeling but you're doing it on paper and also you are as a parent you're getting information about how they're feeling another thing you can do to to as well is ask them to draw themselves and draw a friend of a different race and ask them to to color those 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 two people in themselves and their friend and also and then you sit down and you look at the differences yeah so one friend may be one color and one friend may be the other color you look at the differences and you talk about the differences and you talk about who how special both colors are. You talk about whether the child's got blonde hair or blue eyes or brown hair or black eyes. You talk about it, yeah? I'm a therapist, I'm not a black therapist. I'm just a therapist for all children. I love children, absolutely love children, yeah? So I have to come from a child's perspective on this. So you work on paper, 
with them. And you, and you, you, you ask them to write about their nose and their skin tone and their hair and their family. And they put things on paper, everything on paper. And you're always giving them a visual. There's one thing talking about th things, but when you see things on paper, it makes a difference. Even for you adults, do the same thing. When you see that visual on paper, it makes a difference. You're doing a brain dub and you're seeing yourself on paper. You, you're taking, you're emptying yourself, you're putting it all. It's like, it's like you're vomiting everything upon that paper. Yeah. And this begins the process of giving, giving them a self, sense of self and identity and to embrace their positive self. Yeah. And you ask them questions like, what do you see? Yeah. How do you feel about that? How does that make you feel? Do, you, do they make you feel different? Yeah. Is that a, have you feel a good feeling or a bad feeling that sort of can name it so you can begin to talk about it. Another thing is if you've got magazines around the house or if you've got a, if you've got a laptop, you can go on there and you can download pictures and things and you can begin to create a scene on a piece of paper. So if they've been hearing on the news, all these things, they can create a scene for you on paper of what they're seeing and you, they can create the whole scene. If they want to put a police officer on there, they can and talk about how they feel about it. There's all of that can do on paper, but this is things that you can do immediately without going to buy any resources outside at all. And another thing is um, work with them. Um, if you come across a word like diversity, what does that mean? And you make a fun of it and you go on the computer and let's find out together what that word means. Let's find out together what race means. Let's find these words out together that people are using. Mommy and daddy are using these words, but I need to know what they mean. Let's do it together. It's about having a relationship with your child and doing things together. And too many parents have not got no relationship with their parents. I don't care how many people are talking because everyone's talking at the moment, but those same people who are talking have got no relationship with their children. Begin to create a relationship with your child. Good quality relationship where you are listening attentively to those children all the time they need to, you to hear what they're saying and they also need to hear what they're not saying begin to read your child know your child inside out begin to know their favorite color their favorite food everything about them their favorite hairstyle their favorite tv star their favorite comic their favorite everything know your child inside out and get them to know you tell them about your life tell them about your childhood get them to know because very few children know what their parents do they don't know nothing about you yeah so spend the time telling them about your life about you about how much you love them tell them you love them in this season that we're in children need you to hug them when was the last time you hugged and embraced your child as big as they are yeah and i want you parents to be thinking about this we're always looking for outside resources your resource is right there in your house use what you've got in your house am i going a bit too much sorry I, I i am so passionate about th this because your children no, need to know in this time that they are safe when they go outside there's turmoil but they know when they come in their house that is a safe haven make your house as securely safe as possible that they can tell you anything at all so if somebody's out there abusing them they can come in and tell you you have to give them that space there don't leave them to anybody else i didn't leave my children for school to educate them i educated them at home and when they went to school it was a bonus and that's how it needs to be stop putting your children in other people's hands to teach them black history educate yourself self-develop and teach them yourself do that yourself you can do it find the time to do it and that's called quality time and i think i better stop there because if i go on man this this is just isn't going to finish okay <laughs> so I, think I better stop i feel like i need some yeah round of applause I feel like I need some Westward bombs. If I had sound effects, I would have been dropping bombs and all sorts of sound effects over that, Isha. That was crazy. You're <laughs> preaching to us. I feel <laughs> like I, you need to be my, my, um, my life coach. Um, I am a life no. coach. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, 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 I feel like you were preaching to so many people. My wife's in the other room. I know you're preaching to us as well. Um, you're preaching to everyone. You know, like you dropped so much knowledge there. And we need to do some more work together. Definitely. Um, you, yeah, you need to be heard. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay. <laughs>
let's 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 go on to um, a good friend of mine, Lauren. So again, I didn't ask Lauren for a bio. I'm sure she's got an extensive bio if, if I would have asked her. Um, but she her, her job at the moment she's CEO of CEO of Kidscape, which is an anti-bullying charity. Um, I'm a trustee of that charity as well. And Lauren's an ama amazing, um, she's a good friend of mine for many years now. So Lauren, please take the floor. Oh, thank you so much. But I'm, I'm not grateful that you've made me follow that. Oh, oh my goodness. Where, where, where do I even begin? A Sorry about that. In yeah, absolutely <laughs> incredible and, and um, so important. And, and for me to bring out that theme of relationship, um, that theme of relationship is really important to me. Um, I, my husband's Black Caribbean, who sat next to me here. Um, my children are mixed race. Um, and <laughs> my challenge is how do I, um, as, as a, a white mother, um, the wife to my black husband, um, how do we together in relationship raise our children um, in this country, in the UK? And we're talking about um, how this has affected all of us. Um, and as a white mother of black children, it is utterly devastating. And, and I will not claim that it is as devastating for me as it is for, um, you know, black friends, colleagues, people here on this call, but it is devastating and it's very, very challenging. But this is, of course, not the beginning. This has been going on, hasn't it, for, for, for centuries. But in terms of my journey in, in this space, um, before I met my husband, for many years, I was an education advocate for children who'd been excluded from school or were missing from education. And that was my education because I quickly discovered, um, this was an education advocate in Reading and in North London, that the majority of those children were um, teenage black boys. Um, and the more I grew to understand what was going on there, the more I started to understand systemic racism. And the more I went on a journey around attempting to call out systemic racism in our schools, undoubtedly. Um, and then I realized <laughs> quite, quite what we were facing and, and the blockages we were facing. Um, and that and that fight, of course, is is not over. Um, and so, how do I raise my children? How do I raise my children when I know that as mixed race children, if you look at the DfE statistics, they are the most likely to be severely bullied in school. Um, they are significantly more likely to be permanently excluded from school, um, and the list goes on. And um, there's something for me around. Again, coming back to relationship, there are many, many, many and growing numbers of mixed race families and couples in this country. And this is our shared challenge. How do we raise these children together? And when Meghan Markle had to remove herself from this country, had to leave this country with her child, because it was not safe for them to raise that their son, their mixed race son in this country, my heart absolutely broke because I thought if it's not safe for royalty to stay here, how is it safe? For our family to stay here, um, and how do we how do we how do we go on from there? So, um, what do we do as parents? We are learning all the time. It's not easy being a mixed race couple. We have our challenges. We have a lot of lively discussions. We had them over the weekend. We had them over the weekend because you know me and my sister in law are white, and we discuss what that means and 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 what our position is within this and within history, and that's not easy. Um, but we do our best to challenge stereotypes. So as parents, um, when they told my four-year-old son that um, his behavior was arrogant, that he had an arrogance about him, we called them out. How can you call a four-year-old arrogant? Are you calling him arrogant because he's a black boy? What's going on there? Should have seen the face of the teacher, the nursery teacher. When they said to us repeatedly, he's a brilliant footballer, he's so good at football, what are you doing about sport? We said he's also really brilliant at reading and he's great at math. So can we talk about that? We don't want to talk about sport. We're not here to talk about sport. Again, they look really shocked and taken aback, but we keep doing it and we keep doing it and we call them out together. And we also teach our children to call it out too. So, you know, from a young age, this, this came up early and we were led by them. You know, I think um, our daughter was six when a girl said to her, you're one of the black guys. She came home, oh, I'm one of the black guys. So we talked about what that meant and why that might have been said. And we take it from there and they learn about it all the time and they're very, very switched on. And you can't teach your children to be resilient enough from a young enough age. And I say that as a CEO of an anti-bullying charity, you have got to teach your children to be switched on and to be resilient. 
um, and to be able to stand up for themselves, but to also be able to call it out when, when they see it and to stand up for one another. And, you know, we are a, we are a family of immigrants and of mixed immigrants. My, my grandmother was a Belgian immigrant. She came over in the Second World War and she was spat at because people thought she was German. So we have we have a mixed history of immigration in our family and um, our heart broke over, over Brexit because for, for us that was an attack on our history as a country and our children understood that and they understood why we were upset that we didn't remain. Um, so all I can say is that, you know, I'm here to represent a, a demographic and a growing demographic of mixed families who, who are, are struggling with this together. We are learning and it's hard and um, it's an honour to be here tonight and to, and to hear from others and um, and just to give, I don't know, just a plea, a plea that we can be in this together and, and be there for one another. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Really nice, nice words. And I think, you know, challenges that a lot of people I know on this call will, will um, resonate with as well. So thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. Um, we're going to go to, well, I'm going to try and go to Danny. Danny in Georgia. I don't know if you're there. If you are, please come off mute. Um, if you're not, then I will introduce the next person. Okay, I don't think Danny, Danny is here. Yeah, I'm here. You Can are you? here. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> so Danny's um, a dad of six, lives in, in Georgia. It looks like it's daytime in Georgia right now. <laughs> it is. I'll be back um, in so <laughs> Talk to us. How are you doing? I'm good. How about yourself? We're good, man. We're good. So how, 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 how is it with you at the moment and the conversations you're having with friends and children? Uh, <laughs> First, like you say, I, like I live in, um, in the sense of racism, what we've done since day one. So we can't hear you. Maybe t if you take your headphones off, maybe. Eight year old and a half. Can you hear me? Uh, no, not really. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, keep talking. Can you hear me? Could be in the moving around. Maybe try and just stay in one place, might be easier. Well, I got it on my phone. I got to hit the work. Can you okay, hear me here now? we go. Okay, cool, we can get you. All right. So, I was saying, I got, um, I have six. I have a four year old, I have a three, four year olds, a six year old, or eight year old, and 10 year old. And what we've done since day one is to, instead of talk about, we talk about racism, they know about it, but we instill value in them. We tell them every day that they're beautiful, they're black, they're beautiful, they have value, that they're worth something, they're worth something in their lives. We love them, we cherish them. That's what we've done. Because, like, like I said, living in Georgia and growing up in Georgia, since day one, since I was born, since I can remember, racism and that social class divide has always been there for us. Like my dad, when he grew up, he grew up, he told me stories of where when he was growing up, the city that we that he lived in, it was racially divided. So you had a white part and a black part of town. So growing up seven, eight years old, we knew that. And what he did with us was that he, instilled in us like black history. We learned, I'm eight, nine years old, reading books about Scott Joplin, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, um, Sojourner Truth. He's instilling those. When I was about 10, he gave me this book called The Willie Lynch Letter. And in that book, it was about how the guy gave a speech saying that how he had a plan to instill the mindset of making a slave for the next 300 years. So I'm 10 years old reading this book and carrying that knowledge over to now in the sense of with my kids in the sense that I know I want them to know what's going on what is there and how it's there but at the same time they shouldn't have to experience it so like I'm making like a filter for myself for them in the sense that yes it's there they're going to experience hardship they're going to experience people not liking them because of their of their race because of who they are and what they look like but at the same time, I don't want that to discourage them in the sense of, you know, I'm, I'm below them. Like you said, like there's systemic oppression. It's been there. It's a continuing thing. But at the same time, we as Blacks and we as people, we have to understand that 
we are value. We are we are people too. So yes, it's there, but we can't. I don't tell my kids to harp on. I don't sit them down and say, hey, you know, such and such is not gonna like you because you're black. Such and such is not like you because you're white. I tell them that they're worth it. They're bad. like like the young like the people said before that the color of your skin doesn't define you. It's what you value, what you bring to the table and what you're worth to, what you contribute to this world. And I went off top, I had a whole bunch of what I want to say, but I'm kind of running late. <laughs> 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 but like like now, how we live now, um, like like before, like the history of it, I remember sitting, sitting at my grandmother's house and I, my grandmother kind of raised me. And she got she got some mail, a letter in the mail, and it had two old, older white couple on it. And it was like a little pamphlet, and it said that, glad that we can share the same last name. Open it up, and my last name is Robeson. And it says, glad to share, glad we, to share, we share the same last name. And it goes on to detail how their family back in the day, plantation owners gave us our last name to travel along the down, down the line. So from a young age, I knew my history. I knew where I came from. I knew like the history of my grandparents. I knew the history of my father and what they experienced. And what I do with my kids is that I share my history with them. Because I remember going out with my mother. She's a nurse. I go out, I go out with my mother and she's a nurse. And she would go out and she had white, um, white patients that she would see. And her family, the patient's family, like, I don't want a nigga coming around here touching my mother. But the mother didn't object to it. It was the family. So I'm, like I said, seven, eight years old experiencing that. My dad is all pro-black. So he's all about black power, black righteous. He's that. So I have, growing up, I have both extremes. So learns and like somebody says it's not going to be 10 years five years two hours or whatever the case may be i can hear you sorry sorry carry on i was talking to my wife to get my charge no. it's not going to be it's not going to be a, a long-term thing because like i said this whole systemic oppression this oppression has been going on for years hundreds of years what we can do is just start with our generation with our kids build it up to where hey you value we can't change the past and learn from them so we will repeat our mistakes in the future but we have to learn what can we do what can we do to make it better for our kids and for that so that's what my wife and i try to do we instill that value we tell them like i said we, we condition our kids we value our kids so they know that when they go out into the world it's scary as hell it's all scary but when they go out into the world they can see it they know what it is they can recognize it and they can handle it and deal with it like I said, kill them with kindness. And I didn't tell you in my bio, but I'm, I'm in law enforcement. I've been in law enforcement okay. for 12 years. I've been an investigator. Yeah, I've been an investigator. I still do it. And, and that's one thing I tell my kids is that I've been on both sides of it. I've stepped in with white cops, and predominantly where I live at is 80% black. And our law enforcement, our, our department is like 70, 80% white. So it been times where you have stepped in and say, hey, you went too far. Hey, that's, that's messed up. You, me as a person, see it from the other side. So you, there have been times where you have to step up. There have been times where I got looked over for promotions because one, I have more education and experience than a white guy, but I'm not white. I have got, I've, you know, I'm, I'm young, but I have experienced that. And with the situation with my mother, that's back in the late 80s, early 90s. So everything is not old, it's new, it's relevant, it's my history. So I share my history with my kids. So they know, they know what it is. And they know that it's nothing new, it's nothing old, it's not back in the slave days when they came on the Amistad. It is still going on current, it's still going on now. Wow. Thanks, Danny, man. It's amazing to hear from you. Um, and thanks for sharing. I know you got to get to work, but I just want to ask you, like, being in law enforcement at the moment, how does it feel being in a black man in that role right now? You know, it's, it's bittersweet in the sense of that, 
Like I didn't get in it because I wanted to. <laughs> You're gonna laugh at this. I didn't get in it because I wanted to. I got in it because one, I, when I came, when I moved back home, I couldn't go to the military because I had, you know, I had, you know, I had metal in my body and wouldn't accept me. And I needed a job. So I went from engineering in a city to coming home with no job. And my mother said, hey, I applied everywhere I could, but I knew I can, I can do being an engineer like everybody else. Couldn't get it because one, I didn't have a proper degree. Two, I was black. So I had strikes again. I had two strikes to get me already. So my mom said, hey, you got the fire department and the police department. I applied to both. Police department hired me first. I did everything. And I've been there since. And being this is your sellout or you go out and defend them for the blacks. So they want you to play both sides of the fence. But you just have to have that core value and hold true to who you are as a person. And so like, it's like I do, I call you out. If you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, you're right. So I got to play both sides. It wants you to play both sides of the fence, but it's all about the morality that you have as a person. Mm. Wow, amazing, man. I feel, yeah, privileged. I think it's amazing we have such a range of people on this call. And to hear from you, Danny, um, you know, being in Georgia, a dad of six, black man, law enforcement at the moment, like we are, we are really privileged to hear from you. So thank you so much for staying on the line for two hours um, to, to share your thoughts. Thank you. Really, really appreciate it. Hey, guys, we're, we're going to go on for about five, ten minutes more. I know you've been on for two hours and it's getting late and we're probably all getting a bit tired, but this has been amazing. So if you can, just bear with us. If you have to go, we understand that as well. Um, so I wanted to go from the US to the UK and Matt Vivian, I hope you're still on the line. I'm not sure if you are. Maybe you have to go. And um, if you are on, please come on. Are you unmuting? Matt, are you there? Okay, cool. Maybe we'll come back to you. Um, and there was one person, Jesse. Jesse, are you on the are you on the call? Jesse in Missouri. Okay, maybe Jesse had to leave. Okay, this has been this has been amazing. I mean, if anyone has any final kind of comments or or, or things I would like to say, um, then please do TB. Please put your hand up as well. TV, we'll start with you. Hey guys, I just wanted to give a, a little bit of input on the Caucasian slash white people that uh, brought their voices to this. I really appreciate y'all even caring about this issue. Like that really touched me while I was listening to y'all questions and, and everything like that. Like. The, the first thing I would even recommend to do if you have no idea on how to teach your kids on equality and how to end racism is, is just to show them what you feel is positive at the, at right now. And then you can learn with them. Like all those book recommendations that they have, the one of the books I recommend, it might be old, is Huckleberry Finn, written by Mark Twain. That, that is so, it's back in the day, but it still has some things that you can learn today. It's, it's very it's very influential as far as like the fact that not much has changed in the last few hundred years and that we still have a lot of work to do. That That's what I, I want to just express, that I appreciate everything from anybody that's not black or whatever, even black. It's just wanting to know more and to be on the positive side of history is like I was saying before good and evil I, just, I would just want everybody to lean more toward the good and reading books is the number one that I'm so I didn't even think that anybody would mention that at first but reading books is the number one way to expand knowledge and now that we have the internet go ahead and start typing <laughs> so that's, 100%. that's my last my last notes and I appreciate everybody that has something to say.
Thank you, TB, man. I appreciate it, man. Let's keep in touch. Definitely let's do some more work together. Sure. Okay, so we're going to go to Crystal. And then we'll go to you, Natalie. Hi, Elliot. Hi. I just wanted to um, just say one thing as you were sort of summing up. Um, I think a lot of the points that people have made today in terms of how young people are going to perceive what's going on and how they might how they may be impacted um I, I just think we just go back again to the cultural confidence but i think it's just empowerment so um the the sister just spoke before um with the the lady that just spoke right before me where she was speaking earlier on and i got the idea that she was speaking about the younger children so empowerment for them is giving them a way to express themselves as we work our way up we're talking about teenagers it might be giving them a way to giving them that uh, space and that um attention and giving them a way to handle their emotions again that's going to be empowerment and that might also go back to teaching them a little bit more about the positive side of their history um so that you can empower them because they're going to be feeling disempowered at that age um and and that might come out in anger and other things so i think it's just about empowerment for our for our children really i think that's a lot a lot of the things that we have said in various ways really comes back to that it's got to start with that resilience as a group and trying to instill that in them as individuals so i think there's just been a lot of ideas knocked around today that's really made me think as a parent and a person who works with young people what i can do um my day to day so it's been really helpful and just one more thing um you know on the social media a lot of people are doing the blackout and all that kind of thing i don't know if you saw that did you see any of that mm -hmm. so the blackout tuesday and that and on some, I was, I was a member of um, board teachers and a few other um, social media accounts and they'd followed the black cow and they lost a lot of subs. So a lot of um, white people um, who were in the UK, white teachers and whatever, left and said, I don't agree with your political views, you're being div divisive and they'd leave and they'd say, I'm unsubscribing, I'm not happy, it happened with another woman on YouTube. And I kept hearing them say this thing, which was, I don't agree with your political views or we're not interested in your political views but we don't follow you for, for your political views and I just wanted to say it's really essential I think right now that we narrow this down to it's not political it's a moral issue and we can we can go into it and say oh it's a race issue it's a moral issue it's about what's right um and I think we really have to take it down to that level when we when we talk about it with our children to the um, parents of um, mixed race children who were speaking earlier on. Um, it's really refreshing to see that um, there's a lot of discussion going on as well. Cause I know when I was growing up, I got mixed race, mixed race cousins and I don't think all that discussion was happening in their household. So it's really, really um, refreshing to see that that's going on. But it, I think it really, really, all you have to do is speak to them from a moral standpoint in the same way when um, if anything happens, somebody's, somebody's hurt, somebody's being treated unfair, somebody's being bullied, it's a moral issue and I think it comes down to the same thing and I think that's how we can approach it with our children and our young people so I just want to share that anyway I just thought it was kind of like a common thread and I just wanted to add that. Yeah, no, thank you Crystal it's valuable Please. thank you thank you okay so we're going to go to um to Natalie and Arion and then, and then we'll wrap it up so Natalie over to you hi um thank you very much um for for arranging this talk it's been really it's been really good to to see people especially in a in this stressful situation, an unusual situation of lockdown. Um, it's been, what, three months here, I think. So um, it's, just, it's just great to, to see people and, and talk about this. And I wanted to just, first of all, just, just devil's advocate. I could hear what Michelle was saying. I think with, with um, I'm sorry, let me just grab, um, with Ms. Johnson's point, sometimes when you're dealing with an issue that's so big and so exhausting and so tiring, you might not have the mental space to take on other fights as well, especially when something so intense and devastating as this happens. So I can understand the passion where that she is thinking of, and especially when a lot of demands are, if you, if you look at it from one way, a lot of demands are made of black people to support this and support that and support others. So it's, I understand her passion. I don't want to disagree with, with people in a way. I, I, like I said, I take it as being polite, but I could certainly understand where both of you are coming from and I can hear that. But the, the, what I wanted to finish on was 
to, to try and um, be positive in terms of a way forward. And I t I'm taking my experience as a self-employed person. I've been self-employed for nine years. And I think with this task, it can seem so massive and we've been very emotional and our reactions, including mine, have been very emotional. So I'm starting to think, okay, what do we do next? And it's a question of then going past the trauma, the upset, the anger and everything else and thinking with clear strategy. I, I was afraid, you know, when we worry and have fear, we are frozen by it. And when we're frozen, we can't move forward. We can't do anything. So we have to come out of that fear and think of strategies and small steps. We have to visualize what it is we're aiming for and then come up with small steps of how we're going to achieve that. And for some of us, we don't have to, it's not about doing something big. If it's a protest you want to attend, go on a protest. If it's educating yourself, that is your step forward. Understand, if you can understand your purpose and what you, you want to achieve and how you're going to achieve it, that is your path to success. Dreaming is great, but a dream without a plan of action is just still a dream. It's making it a reality. So if, you're, if your aim is to educate yourself, that's great. Especially if you have children, because then you can pass that vital knowledge on. It's passing the baton to the next generation to do better. Because if we know better, we can do better and then pass on that knowledge to the next generation to do even better. So what is the plan? And don't, don't be upset if you can't do anything big. What is your part in that race? And then it doesn't quite seem so big and so, and so an awesome task. And the thing that I want to finish on is a quote that came into my head from Maya Angelou. At the end of the day, people won't remember what you said or did. They will remember how you made them feel. So, if you're a parent, or even just yourself, how do you make other people feel? So when I relate back to what I said before, if I can approach you and I feel your warmth, you've got a good vibe and you are open, you have open ears and an open heart, that is attractive in itself. That in a way is so relaxing. I can't tell you how important that is how you make other people feel. If I can have an impact to make other people feel good or knowledgeable or empowered or move forward, that's it, maybe that's the, that's the purpose. It's a great thing to know that you can have that impact on somebody else. And then, and if you're passing on to your kids and they do that, man, you've done a great job. So think of that plan and that strategy. break it down to small steps. It's not going to be achieved overnight. We all know that and that's okay. Start one step at a time and we will make progress. It's, it's, gonna go, it's gonna be continuous, it's gonna be long, it's gonna be exhausting. You're gonna want to stop. But just pause, take a breath, read your plan again, go forward and you, you will make a difference somewhere, but just make sure you're making people feel good. And that's what I wanted to end on. Thank you, Natalie. And I think that's, uh, we are gonna hear from Anna, who's, who's from Germany, and she's got um, access issues on her Wi-Fi, so she's here, we're gonna hear from her and, and Arion, but I think what you've said there is, is a great kind of conclusion. So, you know, I want everyone to take that as the conclusion um, I think you summarized it perfectly and you know we all can take action big or small and out of this we do want change and now the only way we're going to change is us personally doing something different um, so Anna let's 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 hear you all the way from Germany you've gone to the UK to the US hi we're in Germany yeah. <laughs> hi um, yeah I loved everything I heard today uh, so I'm going to keep it very short. I'm from Germany. I'm the mother of a 16-year-old boy uh, who is half Sierra Leonean. And um, as I said, I loved everything I heard and I agreed to everything. But maybe I have a, 
special thing to add, um, I wanted to share that um, I thought I was going to teach my son on racism, but he taught me that he is the teacher. Um, because I, I've been um, fighting against um, injustice, all kinds of injustice, um, way before him. And I thought I felt very prepared to teach him about racism, but he let me know that he wasn't ready. I think, uh, uh, Shara, you, you said that before, that I have to see and wait what he's ready for. And I figured um, that the questions came automatically. I didn't have to teach him that. The questions came. He learned everything bit by bit when he was ready. So I had to um, find out what my job as a white mother to a brown skinned boy was. And that was to stay educated, um, to always leave the door open for a conversation about these things, um, to respect his boundaries. Not, I'm not gonna tell him what racism feels like because it's his personal experience. Um, and I have to show him, I think um, somebody said that before too, I have to show him in everyday life which side I stand on. And um, to me personally, that started with how I treat his dad, um, how I treat his dad's broader family, Sierra Leoneans, um, the community here, and that when I see injustice happen to them, I help them with everything I can do with the white privilege I do have. So that's maybe another point to add, especially for uh, white people who don't have personal experience. All I have is theoretical experience. I can read all I want. I can watch movies all I want, documentaries. Um, I can put that on somebody else. I had to learn from him. And just... Thank you, Anna. Yeah. Thank you, Anna, so much. We appreciate that. All the way from Germany. We've gone around the world today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, Anna. So, so Arion, you've had your hand up for a while. Let's hear from you. Hey, um, I just want to say thank you to Elliot and all the speakers, uh, everyone in the chat. I think it's been, been a great event, um, so much to learn, so many different perspectives. Um, there are just like two points I want to make quickly. One is just we need as, as black people to own the black experience because so much of racism is part of reluctantly, unfortunately, it's part of our experience and we don't always share that. And we could argue on one hand, is it our role to share that? Should others who are not from the community find that out for themselves? And there is definitely an onus upon them to do that to a degree. But what I mean more is that we need to be unashamedly sharing that experience. We don't need and shouldn't be toning it down in the workplace, in our place of education, we shouldn't be saying, well, it was just okay what they meant when it wasn't okay. We, we need to say it and, and, and break down what the black experience is because so much of the black experience is not understood. And that is what leads to a lot of the lack of empathy that we have when it comes to building allies. And I think that's a really important thing that we need to do, whether it be via um, exposing ourselves to literature or other forms of media, and just making sure that we aren't, we aren't denying and we aren't diluting the wider conversation of the black experience. It is important. It is one of the key ways that we will start talking and having conversations. And those conversations are the cornerstones of how we start to address systemic racism. We, we've seen lots of things where you could argue there'll be policies on policing, for example, and that, that's helpful, but it's about what underpins this institutionalized racism. And that starts with talking and conversation so others are aware of what needs to be done. If we're building allies in, in allyship, the allies need to know what the struggle is. And if we aren't sharing them, then their allyship becomes empty. Um, the second point I wanted to make um, was just further to what uh, Lauren was saying and Michelle, um, just about understanding that particularly as a black person, yes, we do have the broader BAME, broader person of color. In this instance, it is about being black. Um, I'm in an interracial relationship. I have a mixed race son, um, but my wife is also an ethnic minority. It doesn't mean that she has the same experience as me. 
my son's two years old and I have to explain to him that when we go on a walk, he can't walk in someone else's driveway because it's, if I'm in toll, that does not look good. He can't touch a car because he just like that car because he just can't do that because he looks black. Now that's something that his mother won't understand. She will champion, but she won't understand that from personal experience. And it's very important that we kind of drill down within as people of, of ethnic minorities that we do have a different narrative from potentially other, other ethnic minorities that we're bemoaning or belittling what their experience is, but it is a different experience and different narrative that we have because there will be racism that we can, can experience within other people of color. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed is that there are many allies within um, other people of color, um, and indeed, um, undoubtedly, as we've seen today, um, certainly from, from the white, white community um, as well. But we need to make sure that we do understand that what's happening when we look at the injustices, the systemic racism, it is very much a narrative and experience that we have to accept is ours and we can't dilute that. If we dilute that, we risk the progress that needs to be made in addressing all of this. Thanks, Aaron. Some some great points. Um, it's been amazing, everyone, and it's been two and a half hours as well. So you guys are soldiers. You've stuck with it. But I think you've stuck with it because there's been such good conversation. And um, I'm so happy that it's gone well. <laughs> I was nervous. You never quite sure how these things are going. Inviting people that you don't know into a space to talk about race um, is a good idea but it can also go very left and it can also turn into a very bad idea as well. But I think it's been a good idea. And I'm really happy that everyone has been mature and listened. You know, we learn when we listen to each other. I've learned so much from people who have had completely different experiences, um, especially people in America and the men we've heard from in America. That's really touched me and really kind of opened my eyes and just added context to everything. But I wanna say a massive shout out to all the speakers, so Kirsty, T B Honest, Pragya, Natalie, Devin, Lauren, Asha, Isha, sorry, Danny, Matt, Anna, Jesse, and Elijah. A uh, lot's been going on in the chat as well. So make sure you check that out. There's loads of like book rep recommendations in there as well. And, and this session is being recorded, so we'll make it available either as audio or a visual thing on YouTube, but you'll definitely be able to watch it back. And I know someone commented, I think Claire, you commented that we should do it again. And I think we definitely need to get Isha back particularly. Um, to give us some more fire around how we're going to raise our children because that was good but listen this has been amazing and um, you know something that Natalie was saying about change some people are very pessimistic about you know the what, what's happening now or whether that's going to actually have an impact and a change and I don't believe someone said earlier I don't think racism is going to be fixed in any of our lifetimes but what we do have responsibility for is making sure if we want to see change that we at least not that we at least that we actually change ourselves and whether that's big or small whether that's joining a group that's fighting um you know anti-racist group whether that is doing work with your friends and family whether that is reading more whether that is being a better ally whatever it is there's something that we can all do and i the one thing i want you to do after today is put more thought and effort into thinking about what is it consciously that you're going to do yourself and what you're going to take personal responsibility for and if we can have some sort of accountability within this that would be great too um so i just wanted to end to say just thank you gratitude really for everyone um sticking with it for 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 the evening and you could be doing anything else but you're here with us <laughs> and i love it man thank you so much Make sure you do check out musicfootballfatherhood.com. We've got lots of content um, around fatherhood and, of course, around music and football as well. You've given me your email address now, so you're on the mailing list. Unless you don't want to be on it, let me know. But you'll be on the mailing list, um, so you'll find out about all the other events we've got coming up. And I think we do definitely need to follow this up with something. So I'll talk to the team about what it is that we do. Um, but thanks, everyone. It's 11 o'clock. We're going to sign out now. And bless up. Take care.